Uh, my name is Todd Pearson. Um, I'm an engineer on the data observability team at Pivotal, uh, working on specifically Metric Store, but we have a couple other products we work on uh, in our Denver office. So this talk is, is going to be um, kind of just going through the Metric Store project. I talked a little bit about some of uh, the ways you can use it for observability in a previous talk, but if you have any questions specifically about Metric Store or how you can use it or what it does after this talk, feel free to grab me afterwards or you know, drop me a line after the talk. But the goal basically with this talk is to kind of go over how Metric Store is structured, kind of what the internal design is like, um, so that theoretically you could contribute to it in the open source world if you wanted to. Um, ideally, you know, we've kind of taken this thing and made it um, pretty easy to use. But um, you should be able to be able to build applications on top of it. Somebody in the previous talk was asking just about, you know, sorry about that, how they could add their own alerting scripts and things like that on top of it for a custom deployment. So hopefully this kind of gives you a sense of, of how it works so that you can interact with it. Um, and then also, you know, Cloud Foundry is constantly evolving. Loggergator itself is going through a bunch of different changes. So this will kind of help you think about how metrics are, will continue to evolve um, as we go forward and as the Loggergator subsystem changes. Okay, so what is Metric Store? Uh, it's a time series database um, that has persistent storage. So unlike log cache, which I'll talk about a, a little bit in just a second, um, it actually stores data on disk, is durable between restarts, and lets you take all the metrics um, that are coming through your system and store them so that you can query them uh, over long periods of time. So if you've kind of been using Cloud Foundry for a while, you've, you've probably seen some of the evolution that led up to this, but you know, initially there was kind of um, just the fire hose, and you, know, you either had to be listening to it with a nozzle or a CLI tool to see what was going through it, and then you know, probably about a year and a half ago, we started working on log cache, and then as that came out, it gave you the ability to cache things for shorter durations of time, but it still wasn't durable, and you, know, you still had a limited amount of, of time that you could actually store metrics for, because uh, we were only using in-memory storage at that point. So about a year ago, we kind of took a lot of the feedback about log cache and people who wanted to have a little bit more duration for their metrics, and we started making uh, that kind of same design persistent, and that code base has, has become metric store. So originally, it was just a fork of log cache. We just like took the whole thing, forked it, and started modifying it in place. And that um, has, has now diverged quite a bit. You probably wouldn't recognize the two code bases as being very similar, but there are still some patterns and authentication design patterns that we've used that still are the same as what LogCache uses. Um, it's written entirely in Go, and for the storage side of it, we actually just use the storage engine from InfluxDB directly. So basically everything below the Influx query engine, uh, we just took all that in, and that's how we're using um, that's how we're actually storing data on disk and how we've decided to, to structure the project because it gave us basically the, the hardest piece of it, which is you know, compressed, sharded, time series storage. We basically got that part for free from a relatively mature project. Um, and then we kind of, as we were, were evolving log cache, a lot of people wanted to see if there was a way that they could use log cache um, the same way that they would use Prometheus to be able to support PromQL. We started adding PromQL to log cache initially and it, it ended up being kind of tricky with the way that log cache was designed because the in-memory um, store tried to make things fast, but at the same time made querying with filters really difficult. So when we did metric store, we actually took the entire Prometheus query engine and, and stuck it in there. So our goal with that was to try and be 100% PromQL compatible. There are still some cases where um, kind of authentication or authorization makes it a little bit tricky, um, but I'll talk a little bit about how that works. And that's kind of, that'll, that'll get into the, the role-based access control model that we took from Log Cache, which tries to work natively with Cloud Foundry as well. So um, Metric Store has, has three main processes if you look inside of the, of the package. So the nozzle is the first component. So that's the one that actually connects to the reverse log proxy uh, for, of Loggergator and essentially takes everything that is a, a timer, counter, or gauge envelope, leaves all the logs behind. Um, but it takes anything that's, that's an actual metric that has a, a value associated with it and pulls those in. Um, and the nozzle is what handles the formatting from envelopes to um, kind of our, our native type. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. Um, and the auth proxy is kind of on the other end. So that's the piece that actually um, you know, gets connected to by Go Router, works with UAA and CAPI, and figures out who you are and what you can see and does some filtering there. So there are some, 
there are some rules that we have to enforce with what you can see that make some of the edge cases for, um, for queries weird. So uh, I'll, I could talk to you more about that offline if you run into problems with it, but essentially because of what you can see, sometimes there are some wild card queries with PromQL that you want to be able to run that you can't uh, because it's difficult to tell if you're not an admin specifically what you're actually allowed to see. Um, and then the metric sort process is the, the actual storage layer itself. It takes the writes in from the nozzle, stores them, and then pulls them back off disk and retrieves them when a query comes in on the other side. Okay, so the nozzle, um, as I said, it reads from the reverse log proxy. Um, so that communication stream is gRPC. And if you look at a lot of the, the kind of current log reader design um, and the old log cache design, there was a lot of gRPC everywhere. Um, so we've actually, we've kind of started getting away from that because gRPC is, is a very robust framework, but it's also, it comes with a lot of overhead. And as we started looking at what we were basically, all we were doing with the nozzles were taking points from one place or writing them to another one. So gRPC is built on top of protocol buffers, which is a great um, durable serialization format. But when you have two processes that always get updated at the same time, it doesn't really buy you a lot. You just need to get data from one place to another. So we actually got rid of all the gRPC that we're using internally. We have to use gRPC with the reverse log proxy, but inside of metric store, all the writes between processes um, happen as just um, type length value encoded frames. We just essentially are just writing it over TCP. We have some minimal serialization in place. Um, there's a package called GoTiny. It's very easy. It's probably, you know, I can't actually read most of the README because it's not in English, but it uh, works really well. It's great for just Go structure. So if you have two Go processes that are talking to each other and you don't need the data to be durable at rest, you just want to be able to communicate. The serialization overhead is, is really minimal. Um, and then the one thing that we do that's, that sort of changes the way that the data in the envelopes is structured is we actually take timer metrics, which essentially the only place that that really ends up getting used are um, the, the Go router has this HTTP start stop event that it emits every time a process or every time a request comes in and finishes. So if you have um, a foundation with a lot of traffic, this could potentially be, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of requests per second, um, and you're getting two metrics for each one of those. And when we started looking at the data that we were storing, we realized in some cases, timer metrics could be like 90 to 95% of the, all the data that we were storing, and no one, first of all, no one looked at it, and secondly, doing queries across it because it's so much data was actually problematic. So what we decided to do is, up front, we actually um, do some downsampling in the nozzle, so we'll actually just um, collect metrics for each, um, each different request and request type. So if we get different status codes, we'll, we'll group those. But we essentially do some bucketing up front and then write out the sort of the downsampled metrics. So if you look at the way the timer metrics are structured inside metrics, or it's a little bit different than the way that they come through the nozzle. But so far, that's, that's actually cut down on storage size and made it a much more usable, queryable data format. And then um, the nozzle also does some batching just to make it as efficient as possible to write data into metrics. store. So by default, we kind of limit the payload size to 64 kilobytes, but we also you know, have like a periodic flush so that the nozzle won't hold data for more than, I think it's like 200 milliseconds. It'll just automatically write whatever's in the buffer. Um, and then, so I talked a little bit about, I don't know if, if, if you're not familiar with the envelope type, you can look at it, but there are some, some protobuf definitions that, that tell you what a, a log reader envelope looks like. But we actually try to get as far away from that as possible because there's a lot of, um, once again, a lot of overhead that comes with protobuf, it gives you some, some great um, abilities, but for us, we just kind of needed to be able to make it uh, as, as simple as possible. So really, this is just a basic Go struct. So we define a point, and it's got a name, so that's going to be the metric name that gets written in, a timestamp, which is an int 64 in nanoseconds, and then a value. So all the values that we store are floats, and that makes it pretty easy because everything that's coming through the fire hose has some sort of a value associated. And then labels, which I'll get into a little bit more, but those are essentially just key value pairs of, the, of the, the labels that are coming through on the envelope as well. And then over the wire, we just group things into batches, as I said. So that's kind of what the, the batch struct looks like. So it's just a slice of points. And that, we basically took probably four or five uh, protobuf files that were previously being used in Logregator and Logcache and stripped it down to just that. So that's really all the, all the types that we're sending over the wire now, which makes uh, working with the code base a lot easier. Okay, so going back to the other side of metric store for a minute. So the auth proxy, like I said, um, it actually talks to both UAA and cloud controller. 
and uh, figures out who can see what. So we actually recently implemented offline token validation in the off proxy. So it actually hits the token keys endpoint, gets the signing keys, and can actually do the authentication side of it um, offline without having to hit UAA for every user. Old versions of Logcash used to do that, which could be, it could be problematic for UAA, could be problematic for cloud controller. So we've got the offline token validation that works now, and then we also do some basic caching with cloud controller so that we can try not to hit cloud controller for every, every request to get um, list of who can see what. Um, and especially as we started moving away from um, some of the simpler log cache use cases and started moving to, to, to more of a, um, like, I guess we've moved to a world where people are doing more frequent requests. So the, the less we can hit those external services, the less overhead there is on each request, um, the less we like stress those external services, but also the less that we need to spend, spend time doing. So between those two, the offline token validation, the caching, we've kind of reduced the amount of external work that the auth proxy needs to do on every request. And then um, we use, we check for two different scopes. There's logs.admin and doppler.firehose. And if your user has either of those, then you'll, you'll be granted like admin level access basically through the auth proxy. So any of the, any of the filtering, any of the source ID limitations that I was talking about, those will be dropped. So you basically will be able to query, query on anything and all of your PromQL queries should basically behave like, like normal PromQL queries. Um, and then the, kind of the way I was talking about the, the work that we have to do that makes some PromQL queries difficult is we'll actually, we use the Prometheus query engine um, abstract syntax tree. So we actually break down the queries if you're not an admin, look at the things that you're requesting, and if we have to, we'll add some, some labels to make sure that you're not uh, requesting data that you're not allowed to. Um, and we'll, if you're looking for something that you shouldn't be able to, we'll actually uh, reject the query. So we're able to, to do some of that stuff because we're using, like I said, we're using as much of the prom, PromQL engine as possible, and that lets us actually process the queries just like Prometheus would. Okay, um, <clears throat> so getting into the metric store itself, um, for the persistent side, as I said, we're using the InfluxDB storage engine. So InfluxDB recently started releasing uh, version 2.0, the storage engine is relatively the same, but we've kind of stuck with the, the 1.x branch. So we're actually just pulling from whatever the most recent release is of that. Um, and the reason is, you know, Influx 2.0 is, is still, it's been in alpha, I think might be in beta now. Uh, it's still changing and we didn't want to, to bring in something that was, uh, you know, moving quickly when all we really wanted was a relatively stable, mature package for storage. So that's kind of what, we're, what, what we've got. And, the great things about using the InfluxDB storage engine, it's got good compression performance, especially on floats, which, like I said, if you look, look at our points that we're writing in, we're only writing points. InfluxDB also supports, I think, like ints, bools, and strings. We're not using any of those, but floating point compression is probably about as good as you can get. Um, there's a new index format that they launched recently called TSI. It's, it's pretty good when we were using the old one before the TSI was released, we would occasionally um, have some out-of-memory problems if we didn't have boxes that were big enough. Um, but now with that, it's, it's relatively good. It handles, um, it handles some stale tags well. So basically, the, the short version of it is it, it lets you get away with using smaller boxes for the same amount of, of, um, of data of storage. And um, so far, it's been, it's been really stable for us. The storage format itself isn't changing, which is a nice property. Um, we want to be able to you know, keep adding features to metric store and not have to worry about the, the storage format of InfluxDB changing much over time. And basically for the entire 1.x line, it's basically been the same format under the hood. Um, and then easy data eviction. So by that, I mean um, that we, we took InfluxDB, and if, you, if you're using InfluxDB proper, you can define how, how big your retention windows are, how large your shards are on disk, so like what, what unit of time does each physical shard take up. Um, and we've kind of just gone with the decision that each shard is gonna be one day, because based on most of the people that we've talked with, we're, we're usually measuring the amount of data that we're storing in, in weeks, maybe months, um, but we wanna be able to drop data relatively easily. So in this case, we sort of default to six weeks of data, which is 42 days. Um, and then as each day expires, so as, as data gets older, we'll just drop the oldest day. So that kind of gives you a good rolling window of, of storage, and it's, it's a thing that you know, users then don't have to decide. Theoretically, we could expose that, but it's, it's also something that you don't want to have to change after you've started writing data into it. Um, and in FlexDB, because it stores data by time period, it makes it pretty easy for us to, to drop data easily as it expires. 
Um, and then indexing is another interesting property of InfluxDB. So when, when data comes through the firehose as an envelope, it's just got a bunch of, of labels, and they're you know, relatively arbitrary. Um, and InfluxDB kind of has two different concepts for how you want to, to think about data. One is writing it as a field, uh, which is an unindexed like, column store. And that's kind of where I was talking about. It stores floats, ints, bools, and strings. Those are fields. Um, and then tags are actually, they're not stored. They're just uh, part of the, of the index that InfluxDB builds around your data. So the upside is if you make something a tag, it's relatively fast because you can run queries on it because it's part of the index. It also uses up more memory because the entire index kind of has to fit in memory. And that's where the, the TSI that I was talking about, the new index format, makes that a little bit more memory efficient. Um, so you can kind of choose as you're, as you're writing data into InfluxDB whether it's going to be a tag or a field. And we sort of look, looked at what we had coming through the firehose and said um, pretty much everything should be tags because most people want to be able to filter on it. Um, and that works well with, with the memory kind of that we, we use normally on a, on a box. But we saw a few different things coming through envelopes that were sort of terrible candidates for tagging. So these six things, so URI, content length, user agent request ID, forwarded, and remote address. These are basically things like, so content length is just the size of every HTTP request that comes through the system. Um, it is not something that's worth indexing because it's essentially, you could have any possible value from like zero to infinity. Um, it's also not something that you're ever gonna query on. You're not gonna say, give me everything that's content length of 1,000. Like it's just not something that people wanna do with that data. So by, by leaving these out, um, I think we've kind of removed some of the things that add a lot of indexing overhead and would require more memory. Um, they still get stored as fields, so if you wanted to be able to query them, this data is still available. We still write it to disk, but we don't, um, we don't store it in the index. So, and I'll talk about this on another slide. As you're querying that data, these are actually things that you would not be able to use um, if you were doing like an autocomplete or if using the labels endpoint of Prometheus. These won't, you can't actually look for these directly. Um, and that's that, that last bullet point. So I'll talk about those implications in a minute. So on the querying side, like I said, we're using the, the query engine directly from Prometheus. So we just import those libraries directly, and we just have some, um, some sort of adapters that make it easy for us to, to get, get that piece hooked up to the storage engine. And I'll talk about kind of how that works in just a second. Um, and I was mentioning the gRPC problem a little bit. Um, and we probably prior to about a month ago, we had another process called the gateway. And if you look at log cache, you'll still see this process. So the gateway was basically just, it sat in between uh, metric store and the auth proxy, and it was just a gRPC to JSON converter because um, the decision had been made previously that everything spoke gRPC, and that's not something that you can easily um, talk to from the outside world. So essentially, all that gateway process did is just convert the gRPC responses coming from log cache or metric store to JSON that was PromQL compatible-ish um, and as we started looking at more of the integrations we were doing with the Prometheus libraries, we kind of realized gRPC was, was offering us nothing. And what we did is just remove that gateway process and made it so that the metric store itself now just uses the, the API libraries from Prometheus so it can speak JSON natively. So it actually just acts like a Prometheus now. And that means the auth proxy can just talk directly to that, that JSON, set of JSON APIs. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so now, as, basically as of the next release, so if you look in master, the gateway process will be gone. The next release won't have it anymore. So if you see any changes, if you've been using metric store already and you saw that that process went away, that, that was the reason why. And in general, this just makes it easier for us to, to reuse Prometheus components a little bit more directly. Okay, so I was talking about how we kind of made the Prometheus um, query engine Talk to, talk to the InfluxDB storage engine. So there are a couple of key interfaces that Prometheus defines, um, and they've done a really good job of kind of making these as, uh, as straightforward as possible and as easy to like extract and implement yourself. So essentially there's a, a storage interface, which is a queryable type, but essentially all it needs to be able to, to do is handle these three functions. So start time, appender, and close. So appender will return you an appendable object so essentially, if you have a storage interface, you can ask for an appender, write data to it, and tell it to store it. So that's what Prometheus expects. So as long as we fulfill that interface behind the scenes, then we, we can use any backend we want. So in this case, we just have kind of like a, 
a storage shin that we've written that takes that has this interface on the front end and then knows how to take those uh, appenders and write them out to the InfluxDB storage engine. And then on the querying side of the Prometheus interface is so a queryable is just a thing that, that you, can, you can call querier on and get a querier object. So essentially, once again, we've, we have our own shims for these as well. Um, and this will just return a thing that knows how to use the low level kind of bindings to the Influx DB storage engine, uh, but also handles the key pr prompt key well type. So there's a select query and that's used by both instant and range queries, label values and label names. And basically every, everything that you can do with Prometheus from a query perspective can be done through that interface. So we've essentially built our own version of these interfaces as well. Prometheus just talks to those and then those know how to do all the work with the, the InfluxDB storage engine. So that was really all that was required to get us to be able to, to use the storage engine under the hood. Um, and so there have been some other kind of interesting byproducts of getting more closely aligned with the Prometheus interfaces that I was just talking about. Um, so there's uh, a package inside of Prometheus called Rules Manager. Um, one of those is the thing that manages alerting rules, which is cool because it lets us also be able to um, feed alerting rules into metrics store. And I don't know if you haven't worked with the, the alert manager uh, component of Prometheus, it's essentially a separate process that's designed to be highly available so you can run two of them in parallel um, and as Prometheus, or in this case, metric store, processes those alerting rules, it can actually send them to the alert manager process. It'll handle deduplication and rate limiting and things like that. So it's essentially given us the ability to natively run uh, alerting inside of metric store, once again, using all Prometheus components. Um, and that's something that I, I think we've just about finalized the work on. So a basic version of that should be in the metric store code base soon. Um, and then the other thing that we can do is, is recording rules. So I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with InfluxDB or other systems that so we had something called continuous queries in InfluxDB. Um, the idea here is basically you can have rules that tell you how you want to downsample your data. So if you have really noisy data or you just have something that people query a lot on a long time range, recording rules let you take data and sort of rewrite it in a lower resolution. Um, and because we're essentially using all these interfaces, we were able to kind of adopt that ability as well. Um, that's not something we've done a lot of work on yet, but theoretically, it, it should just work. Um, we may need to do some sort of usability stuff to figure out how you feed these in, because by default, these are just YAML files that you would feed to Prometheus, and it would, you just restart it and it will reload them. Um, I think we can do some more interesting things with the rest of sort of the Cloud Foundry ecosystem to figure out how we want to provide and manage these, and some other teams are starting to work with these as well, so there may be some more evolution on this, but essentially, we've gotten those for free from Prometheus. And then I kind of mentioned this. So we, we've been doing some more work internally um, for a multi-node metric store. And uh, those same interfaces, interestingly, uh, can just be made sort of remote aware. So if we have like a storage interface that we've implemented, we can do a little bit of work and make it like a remote storage interface. So essentially, that can satisfy the same storage interface. Um, but under the hood, maybe it's doing uh, a remote read from another node or a remote write. To, to make some of these multi-node processes work and to, to, you know, to the Prometheus query engine side, it doesn't really, it doesn't care. It's just, it's just talking to an interface. Um, but under the hood, we've been able to do some of this stuff so that we can actually make some of these multi-node queries work. Um, so that's some stuff that we've been working on. I think I'll talk about it a little bit towards the end, but we're, we're trying to figure out if there's a way we can start to open source some of this work to make it so that we can have a multi-node metric store available in the open source. So if you've used PromQL before, you probably are familiar with all these, but essentially these are the, the query endpoints that we've been able to, to make available um, to support PromQL. So we've got the instant queries and range queries, which are just queries at a given point in time and queries over a time range. So the first one would be more like uh, what you'd see on like a, a single gauge. The range queries are more like what you would draw on a graph. Series names let you look at kind of, it's more like some metadata exploration to see what's available. Um, and you can give it some labels to kind of figure out what data is available in your metric store. Um, and then label names, label values, let you just kind of see uh, what, what labels you've written into the system. And this is the place where I was kind of describing, we had to make a slight design trade-off, and that's the, um, the, the labels endpoint will only return to you the things that we've made tags. So in that case, it's everything 
that is not one of these six will come back in the label, uh, labels endpoint. And then furthermore, when you query the label values endpoint, it'll tell you all the values that we know about for a given label name. Um, and once again, if you tried to query one of those other ones like URI or content length, we would just tell you it doesn't exist because the likelihood that you would get back an unprocessable amount of data is very high for something like um, URI or, or, or things like that. It's just not gonna be something that like Grafana or any visualization tool would, would know what to do with. So that's the reason for those asterisks. Um, there's a lot more documentation about the PromQL API and how it works. Um, so if you're interested, just Google that. You will we'll get a, a ton of stuff to read. Um, oh, sorry, keep doing that. Um, so future work, um, we've gotten to a point where Metric Store is pretty solid right now, and I think we've got some internal teams that are using it. It's open source, so you can, you can give it a try now. Um, there's some query performance work that we've identified, just kind of ways that we've connected things poorly, and maybe we're not doing them in the most efficient way, so especially, especially on queries that either pull back a lot of data or um, things that, that look over long periods of time, I guess in particular that pull back a lot of, that have to hit a lot of those day-long shards that I was describing, um, those can be a little bit slow. So we're working on optimizing those. Um, and then I talked a little bit about how loggergators changing. So loggergator is kind of trying to get away from the, the fire hose concept a little bit um, and moving a little bit more towards a world where all of the, all the services are gonna expose some sort of a metrics endpoint, once again, more in line with kind of being Prometheus compatible. Um, and in that world, our current nozzle design is gonna make less sense. So we're gonna to need to, to build a nozzle that either can, can take a list of metrics endpoints and do the scraping itself or like push some of that nozzle work elsewhere. But ideally that nozzle process will, will start to evolve over the next probably six months or so as the logger design continues to evolve. Um, so that'll be something that we're gonna be working on. It may be something where we make it kind of like a, a modular. Maybe we have like a couple different nozzles and you just deploy the one that makes sense for your use case. Um, but in general, that, that work is gonna kind of be going on. And then as I mentioned, we've been doing some, some work on a multi-node metric store. Um, so the goals there would be being able to have high availability. So as you're, you're you know, restarting your deployment, you'll always have at least one node up or, or hopefully one node with, with any copy of the data up. So ideally, queries will always uh, be, be able to be fulfilled even if you're restarting. Um, some built-in replication, so as we're taking data in from the nozzle, being able to you know, write two copies of it within the cluster, so at any, at any point if you completely lose a node or node is offline, um, you'll still be able to have a copy of that data online. Um, and then dynamic scaling, something that that's, would be, I think, relatively tricky to implement with the, the current design, but something we've been talking about is if you deploy a multi-node metric store, what is, what is the scaling strategy like other than just scaling up? Like, is there a way that we could make it so that it was possible to add or remove nodes relatively easily? Not something we have an answer for yet, but it's something we've been talking about, just trying to figure out, you know, how can we make, um, how can we make a multi-node metric store that's, that's as usable as possible? And, you know, possibly at some point it may be that um, log cache itself stops servicing the PromQL endpoints that it has. It stops being there for metrics at all. And metrics store just becomes the single place that you go to to get any of your metrics. And then maybe the, you know, the loggergator subsystem focuses purely on, on logs and some sort of like syslog support for that stuff. And then, you know, metric store is just a metric store. Um, yeah, so lots of interesting things coming up. Questions? Sure. So the, the question was why, like, you know, why why metric store? Why does it make sense ne necessarily as a progression of the things that, that we kind of had before? What what are we really adding? Um, so one of the things, like I said, when we were we, we had log cache, 
I think the biggest question was like, how can we make it possible to store more data so people can actually run queries? Because a lot of these things that you're, you're looking at, whether it's for observability or just um, being able to provide user value for the metrics that are coming through the system, you need to be able to look over a certain time range to be able to, to do some of these things. If you're doing comparisons week over week, you need to actually be able to persist that data. So that was kind of the reason from, from log cache, which was purely in memory and not persisted at all, um, you wanted to be able to have something that actually can, can store data. And so there are other time series databases out there, but none, none of them really work natively with Cloud Foundry. None of them, you know, you'd, you'd have to go write your own nozzle, you'd have to write your own auth proxy. So there are a lot of these components that we had in, in log cache that made it really convenient for, these, for this type of thing to exist um, and be usable, you know, both from a, an ingress and an egress perspective, um, but we didn't have that, that retention story solved until we, we did this. Um, and then I think um, another thing that, that is interesting is alerting is a thing that people ask about all the time. There are lots of external services that you can use for alerting, um, but being able to kind of have this data available in a way that's, that's durable and reliable now gives you the ability to be able to start using some of that to drive alerting decisions. So as we start to pull some of the alert manager work in um, and be able to build that integration, it makes it possible for us to actually like have a single place that can be the place that people go to. We can always say, Metric stores where the metrics live. If you want to do querying, if you want to do alerting, if you want to do any kinds of like roll up or aggregations, all the data is there. Um, and it's, I think it's a story that we just we didn't really have a whole picture for. Log cache was was useful in some ways, but also was kind of terrible because you know you had no reliability that your data would be there. If you do a deployment, it's all gone. So I think us being able to put together a picture where persistence is something that you can just expect natively. You don't have to have a large VM running this initially. It can just be a single node. Um, you know, that's got a relatively small footprint and only holds like maybe a week of data. Um, at least you have something now that you can start to build on top of. And if we get to a world where there's an open source metric, metric open source metric store that's multi-node, then you start to have like that full HA picture and there's, there's a lot more that you can do with it that you just couldn't do easily before. Yep. Would Prometheus be plugged uh, onto this new component? Sure. What, what does it mean for these people? Yeah, so the question is, if you, if you already have sort of a Prometheus-based solution, like where does, where does that fit with Metric Store? Do you just not use Metric Store? So I think Prometheus has a lot of, lot of trade-offs. Like, you know, it's designed to scrape things. So if you're, if you're using it with um, an open source cloud foundry already, you've had to, you have to have something that's pulling all this firehose data in and making it scrapable for Prometheus. So that's kind of trade-off number one, is you've, you've had to figure out how to implement that. For some people, uh, Prometheus can't, physically can't handle all the data because they, they don't have the design, they don't have the ability to do the design trade-off that we did, where we said some of these noisy things are just gonna be fields, we're not gonna index them. So in some, some places, because you can only have like a single Prometheus, there's no sharding with Prometheus really. I mean, you can, you can find a way to, to shard it, but if you just have one Prometheus, there's a certain point where it can't, it can't handle all that data just from an index perspective. Um, so you'll, you'll see it either run out of memory and that's, that's kind of like um, a fundamental design choice of Prometheus, but I think there are some solutions, some, some people trying to solve this that haven't had success with Prometheus yet. And I think we're kind of trying to step in with a slightly more, um, it's, it's opinionated in a different way. I think we're trying to say, this is kind of the way that Cloud Foundry metrics look and work here are some things that we think make it easy to, to handle all of them. Um, it's totally possible that we could also just, if you have a Prometheus, it, maybe, maybe there's a way that we can um, like let your Prometheus scrape some subset of the metric store data. Like I think there's a world where they can, they can live together, but I think there's a lot of overlap, but it's not, they're not the same. So I think depending on your use case, and I'm happy to talk to you more about this because we've seen a lot of different use cases. I think Prometheus is actually a great tool for 80% of the stuff out there. Like I think if, if it works for you and you can deploy it, great. But you still have to figure out how to get data into it and you still have to figure out how you're gonna secure it if you're gonna expose it to end users. There's not a lot, like Prometheus doesn't have a security story. And that's kind of where we wanted to bring something that had that full picture from how you get the data in, how you get the data out and make sure that it's relatively secure. 
um, so that we could have that as, as the default. Once again, there are some times where Prometheus is totally fine, um, and I don't think you should replace it. Maybe you, in that case, you don't use metric store, but I think there are some cases where having these extra components and having this ability to be a little bit more granular with how data is stored gives us a, a bit of an advantage with metric store. Cool. Thanks, everybody.